Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Hi, you're listening to Great Women in Compliance on the Compliance Podcast Network with Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine. I'm Lisa Fine, and today I am speaking with Sherry Williams. Sherry is a leader in ethics and compliance, and her most recent role is at Jabil as the Vice President, Deputy General Counsel, and Global Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer. Prior to that, she was the Chief Compliance Officer at Halliburton. Sherry is a, is a recognized leader and has been recognized throughout the legal, ethics, and compliance community. She has been featured in numerous publications, including Inside Counsel Magazine's R3100, the Power 100 list of the 100 most powerful Black lawyers in America by On Being a Black Lawyer magazine, Diversity and the Bar magazine. She had a cover on the Minority Business News and was featured in the Women on the Rise chapter in Courageous Counsel, Conversations with Women, Women General Counsel in the Fortune 500. More than that, in the spare time none of us knew she would have, she also gives back to her community. She's established a scholarship in her mother's memory at the University of Oklahoma. It is on the board of Brown Girls Do Ballet, which is a program that helps increase participation of underrepresented populations in ballet programs. I am so thrilled, Sherry, that you are willing to take the time to talk about some just critically important and tough topics with me and be the first guest in helping the Great Women in Compliance podcast community to move our community forward in a critical time in the U.S. As many of you know, and we have a global audience, um, that there have been a lot of different things going on worldwide, particularly the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. And if you think, as I do, that a huge point of what we do in, as ethics and compliance professionals is to use our platform to become more knowledgeable, advocate within our organizations, and make sure that Black voices are heard, as well as that we're addressing our own implicit and explicit biases and be mentors and advocates. I know this is a slightly longer introduction than I usually would do, but not only do we have such a phenomenal guest on this um, podcast and talking about this very important type of discussions, um, and I wanted to let everyone know this is going to be part of an ongoing discussion amongst our community. Um, and with that, let's just get started. Uh, thank you so much, Sherry. And let's actually start with you talking about how you actually got into compliance. Well, Lisa, I can tell you that I was drafted into compliance by um, the then sitting general counsel at a Halliburton company in 2011, if I remember correctly. I had been the corporate secretary for several years, and we had a compliance officer who unfortunately um, became very ill and so wanted to give up the stress of the compliance officer role, and the general counsel asked me to take it on, and so I did. Okay. Um, and then I guess the next thing we can talk about after that right now, because it is such a critically important topic um, is in Black Lives Matter. Um, you and I have talked about this a few times now, and I've, every time I learn a little more, but over the last several weeks, we've really come to this critically important point in the Black Lives Matter movement, and there's been demonstrations, there's been momentum. Um, what do you think is making this moment um, unique? Um, and before we even get there, is it unique? I think it is a unique moment. And if I had to describe it, I would say that it's a it's an inflection point that is in the middle of really a perfect storm. We have um, intergenerational tension, right? You have people in the baby boomer generation, Gen X, Gen Z, millennials, and there is a palpable tension uh, between those generations. We have political tension, given where the country is right now um, around political issues and political parties. We have racial tension that has been bubbling for several years now. Um, we have sort of a bleak employment picture. We have widespread perception of economic inequality. And all of those things, I think, 
are folded into this moment. So I really do think it is extremely unique and it's just a cauldron of issues that probably should have been addressed long ago that are now at the forefront of the country. Yeah. And, um, you know, as it's happening right now, one of the things, um, that's been happening are these corporate, re- corporate responses. Um, you know, and, and often you try to assume some positive intent, um, but as corporations have jumped into this, how, how are we looking at that? You know, and what are your thoughts about that? You know, I'll tell you, the, the corporate responses on the one hand have been encouraging in the sense that historically corporations are very reluctant to step out into this arena. And there are a few notable exceptions to that. Uh, Ben and Jerry's is a notable exception. Penzi's Spices has historically been a notable exception. But our sort of standard Fortune 500 blue chip companies have really tried to stay out of tensions such as these. But I think appropriately, they've recognized that this is not a moment to sit on the sidelines. And so on the one hand, I think the corporate responses sort of showing solidarity with the issues that are at stake, specifically those around police brutality and those around equal opportunity for people of color generally, Black Americans specifically, are really important. I think that there are certainly those who are looking at those statements with a very skeptical eye. They are asking themselves, again, appropriately, are these PR ploys so that people don't engage in boycott behavior of these brands? Or are they legitimately looking to put their money where their mouth is and do something to address the issues around inequality and, and bias and discrimination, you know, in their, in their workplace? And so, you know, for example, Adidas came out with a statement, but they also came out with a plan that they are willing to hold their corporate leadership accountable to. A lot of other organizations have just put out statements, and I think that the community is really sitting back and saying, yeah, the statement was nice, but what else are you going to do? Because here is a picture of your executive leadership team. None of those people are diverse. Here is a picture of your board of directors. None of those people are diverse. So if you say that Black Lives Matter, if you say that you're interested in these issues around equality and equal opportunity, then how are you going to show us that if your decision makers are the same decision makers who have been sitting on the sidelines for the past 25 years that we've been having these diversity and inclusion conversations um, in corporate America. Yeah, and I think one of the things about that as well is, is exactly what are you doing internally with the plan, but also you know, what are you doing to change what some of these traditional barriers are and things, um, and we'll talk about some of that a little bit later, but I mean, when I'm looking at what's happening now, just the an automatic either boycott or statement culture, I think you start, you want to make sure that the companies are actually doing the right things. It's not the feel good moment, but more like a movement as you're talking about. Um, so, and I think, you know, one of the other things about that too, is that the, the dynamics in companies, and you just talked about the perfect storm um, of the generations of, you know, political issues all right. But, you know, I think a lot of times we've talked in the past, at least me as a Gen Xer, you know, with millennials or even Gen Z, you know, and how, you know, sometimes don't understand what, you know, they're doing or their attitude. But it seems like the millennials in this one have really been some of the activists and have really taken taken this Black Lives Matter and the moment in, into the workplace. What you know, you're the one who really introduced me to that, you know, concept. So where are you? What are you thinking on that one? You know, I think that I've been 
I've been very impressed with sort of the way the millennial generation, specifically African-American millennials, have really taken on this Black Lives Matter fight and they have sustained it for a fairly significant period of time. If we think about what are these movements that start and then falter, right? If you think about the first time the country was captured by a, quote, movement um, in recent memory, not going back as far as the 60s um, with civil rights or women's rights, it was really Occupy Wall Street. And that kind of filtered and, and, and went away. But if we think about you know, Ferguson, what launched really the Black Lives Matter movement into a movement that we all understood was happening. Those young people have sustained this movement over a period of time in a lot of different cities. They've had members run for office. They've had, um, you know, they've started programs like some of the, the bailout programs in terms of getting out nonviolent offenders who are still in jail because of a financial inability to post. Um, a lot of that was started by the young people in Black Lives Matter. And so I think that the movement has very much been sustained in that regard. And I think millennials push that forward. I think that millennials um, took a really strong stand in the Me Too movement, which is still ongoing. So I think that as much as boomers and to some extent Gen Z have been very critical of Millennials with the whole, you know, concept of participation, you know, trophies, etc. I think that these young people have shown that they are politically aware, that they are conscious about inequality in a very different way. And I think a big part of that is because the inequality is hitting them differently than it has previous generations. I know that you and probably tons of your listeners have read the stories about the millennial generation is the very first one that cannot expect to have a quality of life financially that is better than what their parents had. And those types of studies and that type of information, I think, have made millennials um, feel very disenfranchised, and, but they're also extremely smart, and they're angry. I think, um, you know, I, I can't speak for all of them, but I think there's some sense that there has to be something better for them. And look, they've taught us a lot about working differently. They are one of the very first generations who, are, who have come out to say, no, no, we don't live to work. We work to live. They're the people who have really focused us on, you know, we have all these devices. Why can't we work remotely? Um, why do we have to physically be sitting in an office? And so I think... They certainly have a lot to offer, and I think that this is really a moment, and the question becomes, what are the rest of us going to do to support them? And, you know, one of the things I think is so interesting, I don't know if you're, you or your listeners have seen it, but there are these memes on social media that talk about sort of boomers yelling and millennials crying and sort of Gen X having a glass of wine. And... <laughs> I, I think that that's not meant to say Gen X is laid back because you and I are a part of that. It's that we're kind of used to being ignored. We were the latchkey kids, right? Where mom and dad were both working and you had to get home and figure out how to do your homework on your own and, and you know, make a snack. And so I think that, you know, there's this sense of independence 
and almost sort of fatalism that comes with being a part <laughs> of Gen X. Um, but I think that we are also waking up to understand that we are in some of the power positions where we can help move the issues that millennials and Gen Z are concerned with forward. And I'll have to tell you, I'm proud of these young folks. I, I think they've got great ideas and I think that they're really changing the conversation. Now, I find Gen Z to be a little scary because I don't understand TikTok and, and all the things <laughs> that they do in the world with the technology, but, but they're making an impact. So I think that um, their activism is going to be very different and it is going to be much more public and widespread and subversive than what we're used to based upon on prior movements and prior activism. Yeah, and I think I mean as as a Gen Xer, I think I'm a little bit of that part. The subversive part is newer. I think part of um, being in Gen X and, and being a woman, um, you know, I'm a white woman, but I mean, I you know, you you kind of felt like if I keep working and I do my you know my thing by getting home and the homework and I you know if I can change the rules, I can somehow do this from inside as long as I keep you know keep working within it. And, you know, I think what I've seen from millennials for me is wait a minute, Look, I mean, and I saw it ourselves. I think the idea that this is, even if you do what's supposed to be quote unquote, you know, the right method for anybody, we're not going to do as well. The system has changed and it's time to, to adapt or, and even better to grow and thrive. And I think that is one of the things I learn regularly from people who are in the younger generations and me, you know, how to do it differently and also how to change what the expectations are and to change what is going on around us in a way that will work better. Because, and I'm hoping that that the that the, the, the millennials and also and and our generation and Gen Z is a coming into this more really do that and, and keep moving. I, as you spoke a minute ago, I was thinking a little bit about the trophies. And you know, you used to joke about the trophy and the participation, but perhaps in some ways that was the beginning of really being more inclusive in some ways as well. Just you know, giving, you know, out the trophies that some of us looked at, like, why does everybody need a trophy? Maybe that was the way of saying we're, we're expanding and being more diverse and, you know, sharing everything as opposed to, you know, everyone competing against each other as we may have done more in, in my generation. But I just thought about that a minute ago. So I don't know, um, you know, what you're Well, I think, that's a, I think that's a really important point. And, and I think that there's a balance, right? So yes. when you talk about, Gen X having, you know, having the work ethic that says we, we're going to go in and, and we're going to be the best and, and we're going to work with the system. I think that's exactly right. That that was um, and, and we were disruptive in other ways that were, I think, much more subtle. Right. Oh, yeah. I remember walking into a major sort of Amlaw 200 law firm with three holes in my ear. And I had earrings in all three of those holes. And you could see like the hiring partner kind of looking, but didn't quite want to say anything because otherwise I was in a very conservative, you know, sort of blue suit. And, and so I think that there are certain things, and, and that's a very small example, but there are very subversive things, I think, around individuality and disruption that Gen X did, in fact, take into the workplace. But your larger point is very important, is we thought we could disrupt the, the system from within. I think millennials are like, I don't know, maybe we should just tear the system down, right? And what I would probably say, and, and this could just be a function of my own, you know, age or generation, is that there should probably be a little bit of balance in the two. Mm -hmm. And I have this conversation in the African American community all the time when we talk about the idea of working in corporate America versus building our own businesses and becoming entrepreneurs. And my position is, there is both space for both of those, those types of people, but there is also a need for both types of those people, right? If you are a diverse entrepreneur, but you want to do business with a large corporation, it is to your benefit 
if someone who looks like you is within that corporation to advocate for your company or for your product. The same thing, I think, applies to the activism of millennials around equality and, and you know, better work-life management is that you guys can come in and try to blow up the systems, but if you're not in positions of leadership, you're not going to get what you want. So there is some, I think, partnership among the generations that really will advance this conversation. But what we have to do as Gen Xers and, and other older generations is be willing to really listen, to stop believing that age makes us know everything and really listen to what they say and be willing to engage in a radically honest conversation about whether there is a better way to do the things that we're doing. And I'm pretty sure there are. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't, can't say with one or another in particular, but it, absolutely, there are better ways. And I mean, it's an important time. I mean, with everything for us to evolve. And that's why it goes back to that. It is really a unique moment. Now, a little bit going back in the history of what is, you know, not as unique as the experiences in corporate culture. So, you know, for you, you started in a, you know, in a law firm, big law law firm, and then, you know, your roles now are, you know, C, have been C-suite roles where you are, as we talk about, quote unquote, you know, a seat at the table or in the room. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the biases that you have faced um, and also that, um, you know, that where you recognize biases of others, particularly for those of us in the compliance field who may not realize those biases as they're coming out there? You know, that's an interesting question since you asked me, Lisa. I've been, I've been trying to think through the right response. And it's not because those things did not happen. It's because they were so prevalent that at some point I, I didn't even record them in my memory. It was, it was so expected that someone somewhere somehow <laughs> was going to say something that was a microaggression in some way um, related to my status as a woman, is related to my status as being a black woman, related to my status as being the youngest person in the room, that I'm not going to say I became immune to it, but Unfortunately, there was a certain amount of numbness, but, but I certainly remember I got my first C-suite position at 37 years of age, and there were so many rooms where not only was I the youngest person, I was the only woman, I was the only Black person. And there would be small things that would happen. I'll never forget attending a meeting at one of my former companies, and I was sitting at the table, and a white male actually walked up and stood behind me as if he expected for me to get up from the table. And I turned around and I said, may I help you? And he was like, oh, are you talking to, fill in the executive name, or are you sitting here? I was like, I'm sitting here. And he got this very confused look on his face. <laughs> and at that point in time, there were no more seats at the table. And so he had to sit in one of the guest chairs on the wall. And it, it was just very obvious that he legitimately expected for me to get up. Now, the interesting thing about that is at that point in time, I had the exact same title he had. So what would make him think out of the 30 people sitting around this table that I was going to be the one to get up? And so there are things like that or, you know, being in a meeting where we're talking about 
um, you know, diversity and inclusion, or we're talking about hiring, and someone says, well, you know, I understand that we want to see diverse candidates, but we're not going to, um, you know, negate or diminish our uh, focus on qualifications to get them, making diversity synonymous with people being unqualified. Again, I'm the only diverse person in the room. And the reason I say that, that you know, I believe that, that Gen X had their own sense of radicalism in the workplace is I would confront that. I would say, I'm sorry, why when we're talking about diversity would you marry that with the concept of not following our requirements around qualifications? Are you somehow attempting to... Uh, you know, say that diverse candidates are less qualified? Well, no, not, that's not what I meant. Well, that's what you said. And, you know, as you can imagine, that didn't always make me a terribly popular person. <laughs> um, but see, see, because usually the ethics and compliance person is just generally, no matter who they are, you're giving the most popular, you know, statements in the room. And then we're adding, you know, the you know, what you're doing, talking about the bigger picture, it's even bigger challenge. Right. And, and so I think that over the course of time, there have just been a lot of those types of things. And, and then, of course, things that women experience all the time, regardless of color, where you have a particularly great idea and nobody responds. And then a man says it and suddenly it's like the light bulb just got invented or you give a particularly difficult piece of advice and they go, okay, and you find out later on that they went to check your advice with some white male outside counsel or with some, you know, white male colleague who somehow they feel like is more qualified to answer those questions than you are. And look, I, I still deal with that. And it's just... Um, you know, I would not, I'm very reluctant. We, we throw around these words now, you know, that are, that are very prevalent in this activism space, which is people are racist or they're, you know, focused on white supremacy or they're centering whiteness. And all of those words mean very different things. And so because we're lawyers and, of course, because we're ethics and compliance professionals, we really have to understand that words matter. And so I would not say that those people were, you know, bigots or they were prejudiced. But what I will say is they had biases that had not been examined. And if we are unwilling to examine bias then we can't get what we're, where we're trying to go. And you asked me a question when we had one of our earlier conversations about how have I put those thoughts and learnings into programs that I've run. And I gave you an example of how in my most recent role, I had my compliance team go through implicit bias training, specifically as it related to how we did our investigations. Are we being the objective arbiters of fact when we're doing investigations? Or are we going in with particular preconceived notions about people's ethnicity, about what the culture is in certain parts of the world around issues that we investigate regularly, like fraud, like bribery? And it was a very, very enlightening um, learning opportunity for us, but it also gave us a chance to have this really radically honest conversation about our variety of, of biases and we all have them yeah I mean I think I mean I think we all have them you try to recognize them I can tell you you know for me personally in some of this process is a challenge of trying to recognize my ba my biases learn things and also recognize that my role is to support others and, and do it in the best way possible which is one of the things you know trying to do here but I think that it is, I mean, people who are in some ways, I think also as lawyers, as we're getting as caught up in what the, some of the words mean, it's more important to also think about what is sort of the next level or under that that brings us to that point or how are we 
reacting and things like that to it. And, and, you know, what are the true problems and to learn about them. Right. Exactly. You know, and I think that, I mean, that must've been just a fascinating day with your team. As we talked about in the previous conversation, you know, talking about what biases people had and didn't realize and to, to learn from them. Well, right. And it, it really did. I think ultimately have an impact on our work. You know, I've been lucky enough to work with global organizations where we're going into Mexico or we're doing investigations in, in the mainland China or in the Middle East. And even if you're talking about, you know, you're helping out the HR team because, you know, certainly um, ENC folks end up doing certain types of HR type investigations if the people involved are senior enough. And I ask our team, you know, we understand that some of those cultures are more male dominated and they're more machismo. So when we're going into these environments, are we going in with a bias against the person who is alleged to, who is alleged to have engaged in harassment? Or are we going in with a bias against the reporting female? You know, are we really looking at this through an objective lens or are we allowing our own biases or our own perceived understanding of culture to come in? And, you know, those are the same issues around cultures of, of bribery and other places. You know, if we look at, you know, certain countries in Africa where there is, quote, a pandemic of, of bad behavior or, you know, in Asia, when we go into those places, are we going in with those American-based biases? And so we really broaden that, that concept to how we deal with each other as co colleagues. Are we getting along and are we as open and engaging with each other as we possibly could be? And does it impact how we do our work? Because ultimately, um, you know, ethics and compliance folks certainly make lots of mistakes, but we really want to be able to um, talk about the culture of a corporation and how that culture drives compliance. And in order to do that effectively, in my opinion, we also have to really look at how we're um, managing the culture within our groups and within our departments. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think one thing that you just made me think about as well is it's not just the biases that we may have for or against the reporter, the, the subject of any discussion, but it's the interaction with the other individuals we need to speak with as part of that as well. The management team, mm -hmm. and for example, they may all be taking the side of, you know, potentially the harasser, um, the biases, you know, from other people or employees. I mean, it's, it's, it's so many different levels of that as well, too, for us to think, you know, to, to think about and as compliance, you know, and, and investigators in particular, to, to be right. aware of that. Um, and then also still be able to look at, you know, the facts to some degree being the facts. Right. I completely agree. And how does, I mean, one other thing that we talked about related to that is we're talking about you know, cultural diversity, other things is your role as an ethics and compliance officer and also this perception of, are you the conscience of the organization? Are you then, you know, taking on it all? You know, how, you know, how, how do you work with that or think about that? You know, I'm conflicted about that issue, right? I remember when I first became an in-house lawyer and my mentor, who was also my general counsel, said, you know, lawyers have to move away from this concept that we're the conscious of the organization. And I have re-examined that conversation and the notion of what that means probably, you know, every year, if not more, in the, you know, over 16 years or soon to be 16 years that I've been an in-house practitioner. And to some extent, I'm of two minds about it. I don't know that we are necessarily the conscious of the organization, but we certainly will often have our finger on the pulse of the organization in a different way than other groups do. 
And I think that the difference is that if, if ethics and compliance is being done right in an organization, it is a group that has a certain amount of independence. And so it is not or should not be, in my opinion, as subjective as subjected to the whims of corporate leaders in the way that business units are, in the way that HR might be, or communications or marketing. And so I think that it does create an opportunity for ENC professionals to do a little bit more of speaking truth to power without kind of fear of repercussion. And that is not to say there are not repercussions for ethics and compliance professionals because we all know that there are. But I think the degree to which the organization um, sort of sits somewhat independently, even if it sits in the law department, gives the professionals, ENC professionals, an opportunity to really, you know, bring up difficult issues in a way that um, has credibility and hopefully leadership teams will want to address. But I think just wearing the badge of the conscious of the organization really triggers, you know, operations leaders to throw out that, well, you know, they're not a business partner. So I think that tag can be problematic if you're trying to really do the work that I think most ENC professionals want to do. So I'm always a little ambivalent about that, that statement. Yeah. I, you know, I, one of the things for me and thing I really like about the profession and why I've chosen to be a part of it, it, it is an opportunity to make sure that your company does does the right thing. So that line and to be held accountable, because obviously if, if an organization, if you get to a point where you're constantly the conscience of it, you know, there's a cultural problem that's much deeper than that, that you're required to be doing that all the time. Exactly. Uh, organization and to think about and to put that on anybody's radar seems to be a, cha- you know, a, a, a problematic approach. On the other hand, I think I enjoy the idea of people realizing that doing the right thing and, and doing a good thing often benefit an organization as a whole. You know, similar right now to the conversation of, you know, the diversity and eliminating barriers and biases, you're going to get the best people at the table. The table, you know, whatever the table is, you know, it's evolving to have the best individuals, which when you keep your, you know, I think that that's been one of the things that comes to mind for me right now in these discussions and as we think about it is how how do we improve? Um, Which I think is probably a humongous question. And again, you know, as I mentioned, this is a, you know, for me, these are, these are new, new conversations for this level of substance of this type in, in the podcast. And I'm hoping that we continue ongoing things, but for right now, as some people are starting in their journey to, to learn more and to work, you know, to be supporting Black Lives Matter and other things. Is there something that you would say to us now, sort of as a take-home, I'm going to lost tools, take-home lesson or thought, you know, you would want to share about that, you know, for people now so that we can just keep, keep the momentum and progressing? I would say that we, we certainly have to spend a lot more time listening than talking. And what I've discovered over the past, you know, few weeks, which have candidly been very, very hard on me personally. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I've had to explain to her um, in a really honest but age-appropriate way why people who look like her are marching in the streets. And, and why they're protesting and what the concerns are. And as a person who has a very diverse group of friends, she's like, well, mommy, why would someone want to hurt me because of the color of my skin? I, I can't explain that. 
What I can say is that's not everybody, certainly, and that those people are a very small minority of the country, but they're still there. And so I think that there has to be a lot of listening and engagement because what often happens when we have these conversations is that there is a sense of defensiveness on behalf of the listener, especially if they are not a person of color, because it feels like an indictment. And what I will say and, and I feel like I can say this with confidence, is the people you're talking to are not indicting you individually. What they're talking about are the systems that have impact on their lives. If I am talking to you, Lisa, as my white girlfriend, and I am relaying the story of a white male walking up to a table and expecting me to get up, the, the appropriate action in that sense is to listen and to ask me how I felt and to talk and just to listen to me work it through versus what most often happens, which is, are you sure that's what he meant? Because that invalidates my lived experience. And because many, many people of color, whether they be, um, you know, African-American, Hispanic, uh, you know, Indian, those things are happening for real. Those, those things are not our imagination. We are not being sensitive. And so I would just ask that people listen and to stop attempting to make excuses or qualify the behavior that you're um, that you're being informed about and just focus on what that person is saying to you. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think as, you know, a white woman, the other thing is I think a lot now get uncomfortable with being, or get comfortable with being uncomfortable. um, Right. Because that's how to learn. I think one of the, the challenges too, and this is where is on the other hand, what, what, you know, as, as a friend and as somebody want to know how they, how you're feeling, but also don't want to make you feel that you're suddenly responsible. I mean, even asking that question a minute ago to educate the entire world on what we're supposed to do, because we, we need to learn and do more of that ourselves without being defensive. On the other hand, it's not the story. So I think one of the, the challenges and one of the reasons I appreciate this discussion with you and with others so much is, you know, help at least point us to how to do harder work to improve and and as opposed to like you were saying automatically think you know there might be an excuse or this isn't as bad to say this is someone's experience and to relate that to other you know to understand that that was the experience and that's really what matters and as investigators to kind of go full circle isn't that what we're supposed to do with people who are feeling you know harassed or uncomfortable anytime to listen Right. And I, and I want to say one last thing. And, and I so appreciate your comment about, um, you know, non people of color getting comfortable being uncomfortable. A few months ago, I gave a speech, a keynote speech for a bar association. I was invited there by the president of the organization. And one of the things I said is that particularly white men need to get comfortable being uncomfortable and having these really difficult conversations. And what I said in response to that is because I need you all to understand that the diverse people in your law firms and in your companies are uncomfortable all the time. When we're the only person in the room where we are wearing our natural hair to work, where we're, you know, dressing a particular way or we are having a particular political conversation and we are wondering how people are going to take that or if that is going to have some subsequent impact on our upward mobility. We are uncomfortable 
all the time because we are generally such a small number in these spaces. And if you can just manage to be uncomfortable for a couple of hours and that makes you stressed out, imagine the stress of being uncomfortable every single day. And then being asked to do the same, you know, your work and to accomplish things and to, to go through that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a great way to keep it in, in mind and to understand better and, you know, to keep the conversations going. And again, you know, I don't usually get nervous anymore to do a podcast, but because these topics are so important and to me, it's, there's so much to learn that, I mean, I was still a little nervous as we were recording in part because, you know, I, like most people I know want to do better and do the right things and how to get there. And it's, it's, it's a very, so for 45 minutes is a lot different than what people are spending every time of every day. Um, And I appreciate that. Well, and I appreciate you having this conversation and I appreciate you really wanting to expose your global audience to the the discussion, which is really only the beginning. I'm one person. These are my opinions and my thoughts, and I'm sure there are lots of folks who may disagree with it, but I, I really do appreciate you being interested um, in these topics and, and just creating such an, such an open um, environment uh, to have an authentic conversation. So thank you. Well, thank you. And just so you, so you know, before we close off, we, there will be different speakers about this that have different perspectives. Um, you know, we have pr- tried to have a, a, a diverse podcast, but I, as I said, I think this is a really important discussion. And I think we have a, in the ethics and compliance community, a real opportunity to learn and do more. And, you know, and this is part of on, an ongoing discussion, as, as I mentioned a second ago, and, you know, want to talk to other people and have had a call for different discussions. And even if we have an informal off podcast things, um, I think this is a time. And if the Great Women in Compliance podcast can, you know, help the discussion along a little bit and people like you, are, are, you know, thank you so much. I know how busy you are taking this much time to talk to me. Um, So thank you so much for this, Sherry. And um, on behalf of the Great Women in Compliance podcast, I hope everybody has a good day and is doing well. So thanks so much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.